I'm about to tell you an unpleasant truth. The family you're born into determines your destiny. So, if you, like the hero of this story, were born into a family of Stanford Law professors, then rest assured your life will be bright and extraordinary. For those who don't remember, Stanford University is a forge of innovation that has produced Sergey Brin, Larry Page, Peter Thiel, Kevin Systrom, Jensen Huang, and other international entrepreneurs. But Stanford is famous not only for producing famous technology corporations, but also for producing prominent politicians. And this is an important moment for our story. Because we are not just going to tell you how just in a couple of years a bachelor in physics took the 60th place in Forbes with a fortune of $26.5 billion, created the third largest crypto exchange with a valuation of $32 billion, ranked alongside such philanthropists as Bill Gates and organized a multi-billion dollar scam. We will try to get into the head of our hero, who and how they formed his consciousness, how he relates to the world, what politics have to do with it, and how other dirty games are involved which show our society from an unflattering side. Ladies and gentlemen, meet not at all the usual con man, blower of social covers, Bernie Madoff of Silicon Valley, Sam Bankman Freed. To becoming a crypto billionaire is the most generous billionaire in the world. The cryptocurrency billionaire. Crypto billionaires. Crypto genius. Hi, my name is Sam, and this is my story. If you were a normal person and far from crypto stuff, don't worry, this topic will be clear to everyone. Picture this, a person is about 25 years old and he launches his project. After a little over two years, the project comes to light. A cryptocurrency exchange that raised $40 million in 2019 and has a valuation of just over a billion dollars. From the very beginning, this company has grown by leaps and bounds. From a few million dollars worth of daily trades, it jumps to tens of millions, hundreds of millions, and then on the eve of its collapse, reaches a billion dollars. Thereby becoming the top three crypto exchanges in the world in terms of trading volume, with 10 million people logging in daily. At the peak, there's a gigantic number of $20 billion being referred to. But the real law for easy profit seekers was derivatives. On the exchange, you could buy a leveraged token on something at once. For example, Bitcoin. If it rose in price by 10%, you would get a 30% return. But if it falls, you will also lose money accordingly. Do you already feel how it stimulated one of the human vices? Greed? A clear interface, lots of tools, the cryptocurrency hype that turns people into millionaires, and a fierce advertising campaign in less than three years turns the TechnoGeek project into a powerful company that literally revolves billions of dollars of millions of users. And this whole big money success story ended with the disappearance of nine billion dollars of company's customers. Considering that $5,000 saves a human life, the Bankman-Fried scam cost the world 1,740,000 unsaved lives. I'm sorry. Why I voiced this thought in the first place, where the $5,000 number came from, we'll find out a little later. After all, the philosophy of effective altruism has a significant place in this whole story. But for now, how exactly did people get screwed for $9 billion? To oversimplify, people go to the stock exchange to buy an asset. For example, to buy a share that will become theirs. For this purchase, the exchange takes a commission from the transaction. 
In reality, with the advent of the internet and derivatives, things have become much more complicated, but the global idea remains. An exchange is a bazaar, which organizes an opportunity for buying and selling, and safely earns on the transactions of bazaar participants. Clients' assets are stored in boxes at the very bazaar so that they do not have to carry a purchased share in their pockets. If we imagine that suddenly all exchange participants come running and demand their assets back, the exchange will quietly hand them out and nothing terrible will happen. The scary thing happens when the exchange starts using clients' money without their consent. Yep, you guessed it. Instead of keeping one Bitcoin you bought in your account and in case of demand return it to you where you want it and just cut commissions on transactions, FTX Exchange spent clients' money at its own discretion on luxury real estate, investments in cryptocurrency and charity projects of the future. The scheme is brilliant but disgusting at the same time. There's the FTX Exchange, and there is its sister company Alameda Research, which was also engaged in cryptocurrency trading, but it was no longer an exchange but a private trading company. The founder and owner is our very same protagonist, Sam Bankman-Fried. FTX was not able to accept clients' money. They were not allowed to open a bank account for this purpose, as banks were afraid to get involved with a crypto exchange they did not understand. Therefore, FTX clients were essentially offered to just send money directly to Alameda, a company formerly unrelated to the crypto exchange, to fund their accounts. Oops. Sorry. And then... Alameda didn't transfer that money to FTX, so the company's debt to the FTX crypto exchange kept growing, eventually reaching as much as $8 billion. Why didn't the crypto exchange worry about such a gigantic debt? Their official answer is, Alameda provided very high-quality collateral in the form of super-valuable FTT crypto coins to secure the loan. Generally, generally, you could try to say that everything here is clean, but here's the catch. FTT is not a dollar. It's not a stable coin. It's not even Bitcoin or Ethereum. It's a crypto coin that is issued by FTX itself. So, it means it has small capitalization, which means the token price is easy to draw. So some major player bought 200 million in FTT tokens, the price jumped twice, and this buyer was often Alameda itself pumping up the price. And now the user's assets are held by another company under a bail that is twice the original value. But the opposite is also true. Yes, it all resembles a bubble, a house of cards that will collapse in the event of notable sell-offs. The phenomenon is called a death spiral. If there is a sudden sell-off, the value of the FTT will go down, which in turn will reduce the supply of the exchange, leading to additional sell-offs, eventually leading to the collapse of the pyramid and the filing for bankruptcy. Which, in fact, is exactly what happened. You may be surprised, but the first impetus for the collapse of a multi-billion dollar crypto empire was not criminal proceedings or any other claims of the authorities. It was an article of several paragraphs, which was published on the 2nd of November 2022. It says the net assets of Alameda, FTX's sister company, are 90% made up of FTX tokens. It's fascinating to see that the majority of the net equity in the Alameda business is actually FTX's own centrally controlled and printed out of thin air token. 
Two days after this article, Cheng Peng Zhao, the head of the number one crypto exchange, the most significant influencer in the crypto topic, a very large holder of FTX tokens, publicly announces that Binance is selling off the rest of FTX tokens. The very fact of this, after the recent article, is very alarming for ordinary users. On the same day, the amount of the proposed sale is revealed to the tune of $600 million. Here comes an interesting philosophical question. On the one hand, Binance openly announces the upcoming major transaction, demonstrating transparency and honesty. It even wants to split these sales within a month. But on the other hand, Binance is a competitor of FTX, and now is the best time to provoke a raid on the bank, well, in this case on the exchange, with tweets like this. If FTX is not clean, there is a good chance that the death spiral will unfold and the competitor will be dead. And that's exactly what happened. The exchange faced an unprecedented withdrawal of $6 billion in three days. The token price collapsed by 90%. On the 7th of November, poor Sam reassures the public that all is well, the assets are fine. But then the tweet gets deleted, and four days later, FTX files for bankruptcy. And the day ends with a lovely tweet from Sam himself, I'm sorry, I fucked up. Thus, the fortune estimated at the peak of $26.5 billion fell to almost zero in one week. The image of a philanthropist changed to that of a fraudster. The stable stock exchange turned into a Ponzi scheme which started the process of bankruptcy, and free life was threatened with imprisonment. But how come he managed to create a multi-billion dollar business? Who invested in it in the first place? Reason number one. Sam had something to show investors. FTX didn't come from nothing. They got their first investment in 2019, but the team had two years of successful experience in crypto asset trading. Remember Alameda Research? Well, it was founded before the ill-fated exchange. Here are its founders from bottom to top. They ran around investors, showing their consistent 110% returns even when Bitcoin and Ethereum were falling, and with no risk on top of that. Reason number two, image and reputation. Sam was an MIT graduate, dressed modestly. His hair carried an Einstein vibe, combined with the first reason all of this bought off investors. In him, they saw a new Steve Jobs, obsessed with his idea and showing results in his field. Lives a relatively understated life for a billionaire. He drives a Toyota Corolla. He lives with 10 roommates and a golden doodle named Gopher. Sometimes sleeps under a, uh, his desk on a beanbag chair as well. He's a really interesting subject to, to report on for a number of reasons. I mean, first of all, uh, his appearance. Uh, he typically wears a t-shirt or a sweatshirt. Uh, he has um, this big kind of poofy hair. You don't drive a Lambo? <laughs> no, I, I do not. Well, this is now you look at it and you don't understand how a sociopath and a scammer could be believed. A few months ago, though, so-called smart money was invested in him, despite the fact that he could play a computer game during the presentation. This is a real story that happened on a call with this ancient American venture capital fund right here. This one is also a long-established and prominent Japanese holding company. This one is the largest investment company in Asia, and this one is also a big American investor. In addition to all that, remember what I started the video with? Parents. So if you, like the hero of this story, were born into a family of Stanford law professors, then rest assured your life will be bright and extraordinary. Reason number three. Sam's parents have been teaching law to future reptiloids at Stanford for decades. In that time, they've wildly pumped up the reputation and networking among future investors and IT entrepreneurs. 
Not only is Stanford an environment in itself with rabid networking, but when you have parents who've been in that environment for a long time, your access to people, and thus money, increases many times over. Here's just one example. Remember this graphic. A minute ago, we were showing investors in FTX and Toma Bravo was there. Now, its co-founder, Orlando Bravo, went to Stanford in the 90s. Can you guess who his undergraduate advisor was? Sam's father, Joseph Bankman. And sly old Joe called his former student Orlando one day. Hey, uh, Orlando, uh, listen, I've got my son here who's decided to take up effective altruism. Can you tell the little bugger the proper way to donate all the dough? Upon meeting, Sam charmed the investor, and the latter, in addition to philosophical admonitions, ended up investing 900 million in our Chalmers project. Actually, it was revealed that Joseph Bankman was Sam's top advisor, an eminence gris that the public didn't know about, well, until the trial. Old Joe was involved in the launch of the exchange itself, in the creation of the FTT token, the misuse of that token made everything go sideways. Joe Bankman was involved in not only regulating the company's taxes, but he was also involved in the marketing of FTX and FTT. Then he was involved and, I think, still reigned supreme in bribing politicians. Uh, oops, uh, <coughs> misspoke. In donating to politicians and settling things with regulators in the Bahamas. In 18 months, frontman Sam ponied up $70 million to politicians. These contributions were disguised to look like they were coming from wealthy co-conspirators, when in fact the contributions were funded by Alameda Research with stolen customer money. All of this dirty money was used in service of Bankman Freed's desire to buy bipartisan influence and impact the direction of public policy in Washington. The guy had a very subtle understanding of the balance of power in the American establishment, bringing money to both parties, but still strongly more to the Democrats. The media journalists, they're treating him with kid gloves right now because look at his background. He's donated. He was the second largest donator to Democratic candidates this midterm cycle behind George Soros. He's like George Soros light and they're protecting him in. Still, all these actions are difficult to execute for a 20 year old nerd in shorts. But a 60 year old professor of tax law and business at a top world university, he's definitely more fit for such a job. Old man had already learnt about life. He knew how to find an approach to different influential groups, how to sell goods to the masses, what incentives to push, and he had built up enough reputation and networking in his life to make this story real. Old Joe knew how to get inside people's heads. He had a doctorate in clinical psychology for a reason. Dad's got a real insight into human nature. He received generous rewards for his unique services, 200 grand a year as an annual salary. The son also just gave $10 million to his loving parents. FTX money paid for a $16 million luxury house in the Bahamas, and Daddy still flew on private jets and stayed only in ultra-elite VIP hotels with price tags of $1,200 per night. All of this is from FTX money, and in particular, it turns out, the money of the exchange users. Which, by the way, his parents are going to be prosecuted for. They, quote, fraudulently transferred and misappropriated funds. Reason number four is effective altruism, and we'll devote a separate chapter to that. In 1972, an essay by radical utilitarian Peter Singer named Famine, Effluence and Morality was published. He argues that we have a moral obligation to help the poor until we begin to risk something equally valuable and important. To back up his thesis, he gives this example. 
If you pass by a pond where a child is drowning, you probably won't worry about getting your clothes dirty and rush to their aid. In this sense, the price of dry cleaning equals one life saved. Consequently, if you spend money on unnecessary items and therefore don't direct it to those in need, metaphorically speaking, to save people from a pond, whether near or far, it is tantamount to letting a child drown for the sake of the dry cleaning bill. Singer's radical approach, not a penny of extra spending all to the poor, has understandably failed to garner popularity. But his teachings gave birth to the modern movement of the rich, effective altruism. And here you don't have to spend everything. 10% is enough. But that's not all. There are a lot of nice declarations. Wealthy people should spend on charity as efficiently as possible using scientific evidence. I mean, you get it, yes, it's not just generic altruism to take a granny across the road, but to try to spend your dollar in such a way that the donor gets the maximum effect. For example, this dollar could save a person's life. And now we recall this. $5,000 saves a human life. $5,000 for a life saved. That's the estimate given by GiveWell, one of the flagships of effective altruism. It turns out Sam wasn't very effective and not very altruistic. No, I, I do not. There is another reason for the popularity of this movement. The point is that it declares the following principle. First achieve, then talk big. First become rich and then help the poor. A donation of $5,000 is much more effective to the shelter than your 20 hours of direct work there. Here's the thing. The whole world doesn't like rich people. Well, you, do you like rich people? So what if everybody wants to be rich until we become one of them? We don't like them. And that's where the perfect explanation for the poor comes in. Guys, I'm not doing this for me. I'm committed to effective altruism. The more I earn, the more I donate, the more lives I save. You've heard of long-termism. That's what I'm doing. I'm thinking about what the most important things are to spend money on for our children and our children's children. Aww. Thus, ordinary people no longer hate the rich so much, and the rich live with the idea that they are not just generating profits, but making the world a better place. Everybody's happy. Here too, Bankman has made effective altruism part of his image. FTX created the Future Fund, which invested in breakthrough, sometimes seemingly futuristic, projects. One million dollars to prevent a pandemic. One point five million dollars for a platform for rapidly creating neutralizing bodies. Ten million dollars to develop a vaccine for all strains of COVID at once. But there were some more down-to-earth ones. $5 million for an AI program that does a short rundown of scientific literature. In the end, my goal is to do as much good as I can for the world. I, I got into finance in the first place um, to try and maximize the amount that I can donate. Do you have a sense of how much of your fortune you'd be willing to give away in the end? I mean, in the end, I think almost all of it, right? Like well, how can you not love a man who lives modestly and tries to make a difference for the future of all mankind? The effective altruism movement was made up of a lot of rich people looking for ways to become the new Elon Musk. Oh, by the way, even though Musk is not a member of the movement, his behavior and achievements are very much in line with the principles of long-termism. Worth reading, this is a close match for my philosophy. Elon referred to a book by one of the preachers of effective altruism, William McCaskill. The book, by the way, is the one that got Sam Bankman freed into the rich philanthropist's party. And I'll remind you, Sam's father called his former student Orlando Bravo to help Sam on the path of effective altruism. And in the end, Orlando's foundation invested $900 million in FDX. The effective altruism movement was an effective way to reach capital.
and everything would be fine, and the exchange would still be happy with its users, and projects to change the future would continue to receive funding if it were not for one thing. Financial fraud on the part of the creators of the FTX exchange. Everything Sam did turned out to be a total lie. Bankman Freed turned out to be a real sociopath, hiding behind a nice face of a saintly geek to pump up his reputation and get other people's money. What was particularly interesting to me was his correspondence with a Vox journalist. It is important because it took place just a couple of days after Sam left the position of CEO, his brainchild failed and FTX started the bankruptcy process. After such a powerful event, one is in a severe emotional swing, experiencing the extreme stress of a business burned out, money burned out, reputation burned out and jail time ahead. In such a state, our hero was fond of revelations. He has openly said that his ostensible endorsement of the authorities' regulation of cryptocurrency exchanges was just a piece of PR. Fuck regulators, they make everything worse. He then blows the covers off modern society, where PR is more important than the real thing. Man, all the dumb shit I said. It's not true, not really. Some of this decade's greatest heroes will never be known, and some of its most beloved people are basically shams. He positions everything created with his own hands as a consequence of social peculiarities, rather than as something he himself has done, as a game played by different cultures. Yeah, I had to be good at talking ethics. It's what reputations are made of, to some extent. I feel bad for those who got fucked by this game, by this dumb game we woke Westerners play where we say all the right shibboleths and so everyone likes us. Have you felt the story of the con man led smoothly to existential questions? A month ago, Shang Peng Zhao was a walking example of don't do unethical shit or your money is worthless. Now he's a hero. Is it because he's virtuous or because he had the bigger balance sheet? And so he won. In other words, are you loved for good deeds or for those that bring you success? Sam gives a very interesting diagram of a person's position in society. Our whole life is a game of winning and losing. An additional parameter that introduces nuance is honesty or deceit. If you lost and were honest, it is not a tragedy. But if you lost and cheated in doing so, you end up in deep shit. You're hated by millions. That's the quadrant Sam defined himself in. But this raises an interesting question. How does society feel about those who cheated but ultimately won? I perceive Sam Bankman Freed as not just a con man, but a highly intelligent sociopath who hacked life. He recognized the rules of life so that he could become big and strong. Be born into a wealthy family, hang around in elite circles, show a working product, package it nicely, pretend to care for the poor, pretend that wealth disgusts you, and bribe officials to get protection for your business. Stars like Sam are rare, bright, but short-lived. In his own words, he didn't just lose, he gambled. He gambled with other people's money. And no matter how attractive his speeches sound, if he loses, he's going to jail. At least, he should be. You know who to share this video with. We're saying a big, big thank you to our Patreon supporters who don't ask for the funds back. And I'm The Researcher.